BMW's 2 Series Grand Tourer is a seven-seat compact MPV that offers a classier, more interesting alternative to a conventional Grand C-Max or Grand Scenic-style people carrier. This appealing spin on ordinary family motoring will probably attract a ready audience among people who maybe never thought they'd be buying from this Munich maker. They won't be getting the ultimate driving machine because that's not what they need. Getting instead what may very well be the ultimate small people carrier though will suit them very well indeed. Traditional thinking has always assumed that buyers in search of a compact seven-seat MPV wouldn't be interested in a premium brand. BMW, though, has decided that traditional thinking needs a shake-up and has bought us this car, the 2 Series Grand Tourer. As you might gather from the looks, it's a lengthened, more versatile version of the company's five-seat 2 Series Active Tourer, a model which was not only BMW's first MPV, but also the first to break away from the rear-wheel drive configuration that had previously defined the Bavarian maker. The front-wheel drive setup used here is key, of course, to this class of car. Without it, you can't achieve the interior packaging that people carrier buyers need, especially if you want to keep the shape of your contender relatively compact. With front-wheel drive in place, though, a whole new area of deceptively spacious design can be opened up. As BMW's engineers have found in developing the range of increasingly versatile models being offered by the company's Mini brand. It made perfect sense for them to use that front-driven mini architecture in creating the 2 Series Active Tour model that I just mentioned, which launched in the autumn of 2014. And having created that car, it was just as logical to lengthen the platform to create this seven-seat Grand Tourer version, launched in the summer of 2015. In one sense, this is what BMW calls a retention car. It's there to keep buyers loyal who would otherwise be forced to desert the brand to meet the needs of a growing family. But it's also there to attract customers who never before have had the opportunity to buy a BMW. The brand has, after all, never previously sold a model offered as standard with seven seats. Inevitably, these people will be asked to pay a little more than they'd have to find for a mainstream alternative. But in return, they'll be getting better quality, extra technology and a more dynamic drive. Plus, higher residuals that'll deliver back much of that price premium to them at resale time. Such are the attractions of the first premium compact model to offer seven seats. The first to include the option of four-wheel drive and the first, perhaps, to be truly aspirational. Let's check it out. So, what might a front-driven seven-seat BMW be like to drive? Fans of the brand will have their concerns here. From their perspective, any BMW trying to power through its front wheels at the same time as trying to steer with them uh, wouldn't really be well, a proper BMW. To be honest, we've always thought that to be a rather simplistic perspective, one that assumes that all front-driven cars are dull to drive. Have a go in any current generation Mini and you'll discover that that simply isn't true, all of which prompted BMW's development engineers to wonder what they could create if they were to put their own spin on Mini underpinnings and Mini engine wear. And that's what they did in creating this 2 Series Grand Tourer and its Active Tourer model stablemate. With all of that in mind, uh, on the move I was expecting this car to be far more Mini-like than most of the time it actually is. The Munich men have intentionally dumbed the responses of this 2 Series model down a little, mindful perhaps that a Cooper-style go-kart-like feel is less appealing to BMW buyers and might be even less well-received in the MPV segment. That said, this Grand Tourer model still represents a firmer riding and more driver-orientated choice than many Grand Scenic or Grand C-Max style buyers will be used to. And you get that sporty feel, whatever your choice, between the settings provided by the standard drive performance control system, the rocker switch for which you'll find down here by the gear stick. Ah yes, drive performance control. 
You might be familiar with this kind of thing by now, a uh, setup that allows you to tweak the steering, the throttle and the stability control system thresholds uh, depending on the operating mode that you select. Gear change times too if, like many 2 Series Grand Tourer buyers, you decide against the slick 6-speed stick shifter and order your car with automatic transmission. Ignore drive performance control or select its most relaxed comfort or efficient Eco Pro settings and the travelling experience in this car, although very comfortable, isn't especially memorable. Push the rocker switch forward into sport though and the reaction you get immediately feels keener and more alert, although it's unfortunately accompanied by rather artificially heavy steering. Still, the whole experience does potentially become more mini-like, with further dynamic development possible if you spend a bit of extra cash and opt for the electronic damping setup. This works through the drive performance control system's uh, same three modes and is able to alter the ride to suit the road you're on and the mood that you're in. It makes this car, in short, a more rewarding driving companion than you'd have thought a compact seven-seat MPV ever could be. You might reasonably point out that this isn't saying very much, and sure enough, if you switch into this Grand Tourer from, say, BMW's 1 Series sports hatch, or even something more ordinary like a Ford Focus, you'll notice the extra body roll around the bends. But come to this car from a more comparable rival, say a conventional Grand Scenic or Grand C-Max style MPV, and you might well be pleasantly surprised. Under the bonnet, the range begins with the same one and a half litre, three cylinder petrol and diesel units that you'll find in a Mini. These are powering the most affordable 136 brake horsepower 218i and 116 brake horsepower 216d Grand Tourer derivatives. Both offer quite an acceptable turn of pace, with the 216d uh, managing 62 miles an hour in 11.4 seconds on the way to 119 miles an hour, and the 218i variant improving that to 9.8 seconds and 127 miles an hour. The figures incidentally stay the same whether you opt for manual transmission or the extra cost six speed step automatic. Whatever your choice, 218i or 216d, in both cases there's more refinement than you might expect a three-cylinder engine to be able to provide, thanks to the addition of a balancer shaft to the unit's standard spec. The one-litre EcoBoost three-cylinder unit you get in a rival Ford Grand C-Max doesn't get this and can be raucously unrefined as a result. So, base petrol and diesel versions of this 2 Series Grand Tourer make sense. We'd suggest, though, that you shouldn't opt for either one of them before you've tried the variant that will probably account for the majority of sales, the volume to an 8D diesel derivative. Under the bonnet here, there's a larger, more conventional four-cylinder power plant offering 150 brake horsepower and far pokier performance, with 62 miles an hour just 9.5 seconds away en route to 127 miles an hour. More importantly, with around 25% more pulling power than you get in the base 216D model, this 218D is much better suited to lugging around a car full of passengers. True, it isn't the most refined diesel we've ever driven, but at speed it settles down into a very acceptable cruising thrum. Most won't feel the need to go much faster in this car, but should that be your desire, then your dealer will point you toward a couple of other variants. Of minority interest is the petrol-powered 192 brake horsepower 220i model, which uses the Mini Cooper S Hot Hatch's turbo 2-litre unit to make 62 miles an hour in 7.9 seconds en route to 138 miles an hour. More relevant to our market is the 190 brake horsepower 220D diesel variant that we're trying here, a car you have to have with the 8-speed automatic gearbox that's optional on the other four-cylinder models. With the 220D, you get the chance to pay extra for BMW's X-Drive four-wheel drive system. That's what we're trying here. A setup that really comes into its own in the winter months, distributing as it can almost 100% of power to either axle or a mix between uh, both front and rear. Either way, the car will be kept firmly planted through the tightest bends in the foulest weather. The extra X-Drive traction aids performance too, the 0-62 miles an hour sprint time improving from the 8 second showing you get in the two-wheel drive 220D model to just 7.8 seconds. You'll be choosing this car because you want a BMW, but you need a people carrier.
those whose priorities lie that way around probably won't mind making a few practical compromises to buy into the Munich Maker's model range. But, as it turns out here, very few are necessary. True, this seven-seat two-series Grand Tourer isn't sized to regularly accommodate seven adults, but then neither are any of its rivals in the seven-seat compact MPB class. Uh, compare this car against Grand C-Max and Grand Scenic Star models rather than bigger Galaxies and Chirans from the next segment up, and practically it stacks up pretty well. That's thanks to a 210mm increase in length and a 15mm increase in height over its already pretty spacious 5-seat 2-series Active Tourer stablemate. Like that Active Tourer model, this Grand Tourer sits on a lengthened version of the same platform used by the Mini Hatch 5-door and manages to offer a mass of appealing contradictions when you start to examine its position in the wider BMW model lineup. It's significantly shorter than the Munich Maker's pricier 3 Series Touring Estate, for example, yet can potentially swallow far more luggage. It doesn't seek the kind of SUV-style buyer courted by BMW's X1 crossover, yet still decides to sit its driver 10mm higher off the ground. And there's room underneath for the kind of optional four-wheel drive system that one series buyers aren't allowed to have, despite that model's supposed emphasis on handling and traction. Our favourite stat, though, relates to rear seat space. Now, potentially, you can get more with this car than you would in a huge executive-class BMW 5 Series touring estate and more seats down luggage capacity, too. Such are the benefits of switching to front-wheel drive. So, yes, this car sounds like it's going to be practical. You'd have to say that it's pretty stylish, too, at least by the rather frumpy standards set by conventional compact MPV rivals like Ford's Grand C-Max and Volkswagen's Turan. Cover up the badges and you wouldn't necessarily guess this to be a BMW, but start to examine the details and the Bavarian influences begin to shine through. Take this front end, shared with the Active Tourer model and marked out with a series of familiar brand touches. So you get these twin round headlamps flanking a familiar central kidney grille that sits above large air intakes sighted on the far edges of the nose. A bit of car park cred then, which is very different from the sort of thing that you'd normally find on an MPV, as is the sportier demeanour created by a whole series of little touches. The short front and rear overhangs, the wedgie profile, the crisp contours, its smart swage lines, and the way that this high sculpted bonnet combines with the low windscreen. It all points to the kind of stylish attention to detail that you'd expect from this Munich maker. In fact, only at the rear does practicality assume priority. Though even here, there are smart, high-tech touches. Examples include the L-shaped LED rear light clusters and these vertical air-deflecting blades that sit on either side of the tailgate glass. Plenty then to disguise the sensible virtues that a car of this kind should have. Now, though, it's time to see if this active tourer model could really cut the mustard in the muddy dog, smelly gym kit and family holiday friendly world of the compact MPV. Could you really live with one? Well, first impressions are encouraging. For a start, you get an electrically operated tailgate as standard, which is pretty rare in this class. This one's been embellished with an optional feature that allows you to raise it by waving your foot beneath a bumper if, key in pocket, you approach the car with both hands laden down with bags. Once the hatch rises, you're faced with, well, not a lot if all seven seats are upright. There's just 145 litres of space on offer. But then that is always going to be the case with any car trying to squeeze three rows of seating into just four and a half metres of body length. Still, there's virtually no load lip uh, to lift your stuff over, and you do get the bonus of this small lidded underfloor compartment, which, as you can see, can neatly swallow the extending boot area cover so it doesn't get in the way when it's not in use. There are also corner compartments on either side, along with lashing points and bag hooks, should you need them. Much of the time, of course, you're not going to need these two extra chairs and folding them into the floor increases boot space up to 560 litres. That's 92 litres more than the five-seat Active Tourer model can offer and 65 litres more than you get from a three-series touring estate. To give you some segment competitor perspective, that's a little more than you get in a comparable Citroen Grand C4 Picasso and a little less than you get in a rival Volkswagen Touran.
If you have uncomplaining middle seat occupants who are prepared to slide that centre bench right forward, then you could potentially increase this capacity to as much as 720 litres while still being able to take five people. An optional extended storage pack offers attachments like a load net to help keep things in place should you get a bit carried away on the journey back from the supermarket. Need more room? Well, if the item in question is merely long and thin, like a set of skis, it may suffice merely to flatten the middle part of this 40-20-40 split folding rear backrest. If, though, you really need to supersize your space, then the rear bench drops electronically at the touch of a button to reveal a cargo area that's 1,820 litres in size and delivers you 310 litres more than the comparable Active Tourer model could offer and 150 litres more than you get from the kind of BMW 5 Series Touring Estate that's half a metre longer in length. In fact, in the BMW model lineup, only the huge X5 SUV offers a bigger load bay than this. True, some compact MPVs do offer a little more room than this, but we don't think many buyers will need it. More of an issue for us is that A, the complete seats fold area isn't completely flat, and B, that in this configuration, you get various crevices and hollows into which small items can disappear. This space can be extended even further if you opt for an extra cost fold flat front passenger seat which would allow this 2 series model to swallow items up to 2.4 metres long, a uh, surfboard for example. Unfortunately you can't fit this feature if the front chairs are electrically operated which is why we don't have it here. Talking of seats, because the second row chairs in this car fold into the floor, they're not removable in the way that they would be in, say, a rival Renault Grand Scenic. Still, that's a level of practicality this Grand Tourer doesn't aspire to. BMW can't envisage owners of this car wanting to lug the seats in and out. And they're probably right. Switch your focus from packages to people, and by and large, the space provided is equally class competitive. The rear doors open nice and wide. And once inside, there's decent space for three fully sized adults, although they don't get three separate seats in the way that they would in some MPV rivals. Instead, the backrest has a 40 20 40 split, which creates a narrow central position, really appropriate only for a child who'll have to sit with legs splayed out either side of the kind of raised transmission tunnel you'd think you really wouldn't need on a front driven car. Nor has the vehicle platform been designed in a manner that would facilitate the kind of underfloor compartments that you would get back here in uh, Citroen or Renault Rivals. Although you do get these elasticated underseat storage areas on each side in compensation. You have to pay extra to get this folding centre armrest with cup holders, but all Grand Tour models do get these seat back tables fitted as standard. Unfortunately, because each tray is mounted on a single grooved spine, the plastic surface feels rather flimsy. Still, you can replace them with attachments onto which your kids can clip their tablet screens. If this was our car, that's probably what we'd do. Despite these caveats, though, we're favourably impressed with what's on offer here. For young ones, three universal child seats could clip in side by side. Adults, meanwhile, will find that the seat base is split 60-40 and that each segment slides forwards and backwards over while 130mm range. Now, that means you can either prioritise your legroom or space in the compartment behind you. Plus, in the rearmost possession, you get almost limousine-like standards of stretching space. And the backrests recline for greater comfort on longer journeys. And the seats themselves are set a little higher up than they would be on the equivalent five-seat active tour model, which gives middle row uh, folks a better view forward. Because of this, the Grand Tourer's roof is 50 millimetres higher than it would be on an active Tourer model. Um, high enough, in fact, to make it possible to specify the optional panoramic glass roof that we got fitted here without creating headroom compromises. It's certainly a nice extra cost feature to have, lightening what would otherwise be a rather dark space. Time to visit the third row, accessible via a quick tilt and slide comfort access function. The entry process is quite tight and getting your gran into the back of a Grand Tourer would certainly be a challenge. 
but then MPVs of this kind aren't really designed to take large adults at the very back, which is why two Isofix child seat attachments are provided here. That said, thanks to the extra 120 millimetres of length between front and rear wheels that this Grand Tourer model enjoys over its active Tourer stablemate, a couple of fully grown folk could easily cope back here on short trips without lasting claustrophobia. And occupants are provided with reading lights, a 12 volt socket, cup holders and a coin tray. Let's go up front, which really is the area of this car that we think will sell it to potential buyers. Light, spacious, beautifully appointed, the cabin here offers a level of quality far removed from that of any other compact MPV we've ever tried. In fact, to be honest, it's a level of quality removed from some of the other models' BMW cells, even a few of the quite expensive ones. It's based around this imposing layered dashboard that on plusher models like this one curves into the cabin in a symmetrical wave, garnished here with leather, aluminium and bright work. The only slight issue with the layered moulding is that some taller front seat passengers may find their knees knocking against the lower section of the dash. There's also a minor issue in the way that the gear stick slightly obscures the climate controls. As usual in the brand's modern models, the iDrive infotainment setup's freestanding multifunction colour screen takes pride of place in the middle of the fascia, set high enough up um, in the dash to allow you to refer to it without taking your eyes too far off the road. The display isn't of the current trendy touchscreen variety, being controlled instead by this circular rotary dial down by the gear stick. Still, if there is a better, more intuitive system of this sort currently on the market, then we have not tried it. In terms of the driving position, you don't sit quite as high up as you would in some rival mainstream MPVs, but you are still well positioned for a commanding view of the road ahead. Uh, a couple of caveats need mentioning here though. Firstly, the fact that these large pillars either side of the windscreen slightly restrict your visibility at junctions. And secondly, that the chunky pillars at the rear also rather get in the way. So it's just as well that BMW fits rear parking sensors as standard. These are issues that you quickly adjust to though, and it's certainly easy to get comfortable thanks to plenty of rake and reach adjustments from a smart uh, leather trimmed steering wheel through which you view the usual crystal clear set of BMW dials. The cabin's practical too, as that of any MPV should be. So there are decently sized door bins that can each take a one and a half litre bottle, neat storage compartments beneath the seats, a decently sized cooled glove box and cleverly staggered cup holders in the centre console. You also get a large space under the centre armrest that can be used to charge your phone and a neat hidden compartment in the centre stack. This seven-seat two-series Grand Tourer sells at a premium of around £2,500 over its five-seat active Tourer stablemate, which means the pricing here sits in the £25,000 to £35,000 bracket, depending on the spec and model you choose. If you're set on a BMW, you might be interested to know that this kind of money still represents a two to £3,000 saving over a comparable version of the Munich maker's much less spacious three-series Touring Estate with exactly the same engine. Time to get specific though about Grand Tourers. If you're shopping at the bottom of the range, you'll probably want to find the premium of around a thousand pounds that BMW asks to progress from the base 218i petrol version to the base 216d diesel. A budget permitting would suggest that you also consider going a step further still. Yes, the next model up in the diesel range, the 218D, is around £1,100 more than its 216D stablemate, and that means an asking price of around £27,000, which is certainly a lot for this class of MPV. Still, in return, you get a high-quality product that in this form will give you a far more flexible engine if you're going to be regularly loading this car up. At 218D level, you also get the option of a more sophisticated 8-speed automatic gearbox for an additional £1,550. The entry-level variants are restricted to a simpler 6-speed Steptronic Auto box that's uh, £1,250 extra. 
If you can afford an even pokier power plant, then you'll certainly need a premium budget to get it because the faster derivatives only come with the prices trim levels. One of these is the top 220D diesel version we're trying here, the only variant to offer the option of BMW's X-Drive all-wheel drive system. This setup's offered at a £1,750 premium over two-wheel drive with this engine and would be well tempted to get it. Onto the value proposition all of that represents. Well, you'd be expecting this 2 Series Grand Tour to cost more than its mainstream brand compact 70 MPV rivals. But just how much more are we talking? Well, perhaps not as much as you might think. True, a comparable Ford Grand C-Max or Peugeot 5008 would probably save you around £4,000 in list price terms over this car, as would an entry-level petrol-powered Citroen Grand C4 Picasso. And if you went for a seven-seater like Toyota's Verso or Kia's Karens, you could potentially save even more. Other rivals, though, are pricier. Take pokier versions of that Citroen model and Renault's Grand Scenic, where the difference to this BMW narrows to around £3,000. More pertinently, if you pitch against what we think is easily the closest quality competitor to this car, Volkswagen's Turan, the difference is more like £2,000 or less once you take into account much higher equipment levels of this Grand Tourer model. If, having considered all of that, you conclude that this 7-seat 2-series model really is what you want, then you're going to need to know exactly how generous BMW has been with a standard spec. And the answer is that this car is really very well equipped indeed. So even at base SE trim level, you get 16-inch alloy wheels, LED daytime running lights, front fog lights, an automatic tailgate, park distance control rear parking sensors, heated powered mirrors and heated washer jets, roof rails, an alarm, a chrome finished exhaust pipe, plus auto headlamps and wipers. Inside, the sliding rear bench and the 40-20-40 split folding rear backrest is standard fit. Plus, there are niceties like two-zone automatic air conditioning, comfort go keyless engine start, and the drive performance control system that, via EcoPro, comfort and sport modes, allows you to alter throttle response, steering feel, and possibly gear change timing to suit the way that you want to drive. Other standard items include a sport multifunction leather trim steering wheel with a speed limiter function to preserve your license through the roadworks or through urban areas. Plus there's Bluetooth with a USB interface and audio streaming functionality, a DAB digital radio and a decent quality BMW professional radio setup with six speakers, a CD player and a 6.5 inch iDrive infotainment screen that you can use to view the standard BMW navigation system. Further up the range, sport models get a smarter look and feel along with bigger 17-inch wheels. The luxury versions get wood and leather trim and this top M Sport variant gets a body kit, uh, large 18-inch wheels and stiff M Sport suspension. Those last two features together create a rather over-firm ride, but you can correct that issue by specifying an electronic damper control system that allows you to tweak the suspension to suit the road you're on and the mood you're in. M Sport models also get run-flat tyres, and that's something we want to fit as an option on lesser trim levels. Otherwise, you'll be stuck with the fiddly BMW Mobility Tyre Inflation Kit that's all you get as standard to help in cases of a puncture. On to options and three main extra cost packages, all of which we've got fitted here. The driver comfort package adds front parking sensors, a park assist system that steers you into tight spaces and cruise control with a braking function to slow you should you get too close to the car in front. We'd also want to look at the technology package that adds things like a reversing assist camera, uh, keyless entry and adaptive LED headlights that turn with the bends and dip themselves at night. Don't go spending too much on items like these, though, until you've considered the merits of BMW's high-tech Navigation Plus package. This gives you a head-up display that, that projects key driving information into your line of sight at the base of the windscreen, plus a range of features that you can access via a larger 8.8-inch version of the iDrive infotainment screen. These include real-time traffic information and access to BMW's suite of online services, which are designed to enhance your journey by sending you up-to-date information while you're at the wheel. Uh, things like business and stock market news, weather updates, 
and an array of mobile office functions. Then there are services such as Google Local Search, plus uh, telephone directories, restaurant and hotel guides. Uh, with online services fitted, you can also use the BMW Route Planner to save your chosen route on your home computer before sending it onto your car. Of course, you want to go further, there's plenty else on the options list to tempt you. Here, for example, we've got the desirable panoramic glass sunroof, along with niceties like sun protection glass, an auto-dimming rear-view mirror, brushed aluminium cabin inserts, power-folding mirrors, electric seats and internet access. There's also the option to open the electric tailgate by waving your foot beneath the bumper and a full-house Harman Kardon surround sound stereo system. Add all those features to the three option packs and you've got a rather frightening list price of around £40,000. Other extra cost features you could look at include sports seats, the sharper variable sports steering setup, a heated steering wheel, the fold flat front passenger seat and a versatile black and beige bag that clips onto the front seat back and can be taken out for use when you're out and about. More practical items include a smart roof box and a bike carrier that can carry two cycles while still letting you into the luggage bay. Safety is, as you'd expect from BMW, well accounted for, hence this car's full house five-star Euro NCAP safety rating. You'd expect the basics, twin front side and curtain airbags, plus the usual electronic assistance for traction and stability control. Braking too, with a neat brake drying system that keeps the brake discs free of moisture in wet weather. And a multi-collision braking function that, in the event of an impact, will keep brake pressure applied until you come to a complete stop. There's also an alertness assistant that monitors you for signs of drowsiness and a performance control system that suppresses understeer in tight turns that'll also see you experience extra traction from an electronic differential lock control setup. Other neat safety features fitted as standard across the range include a hill start assistant to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and the BMW emergency call with teleservices system. In an accident, this can automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location, which could be a lifesaver. We should also mention that all variants get what BMW calls a collision warning with city braking system. Over 30 miles an hour, this will warn you if an accident has is detected and pre-prepare the brakes to be optimally effective. Under 30 miles an hour, at town speeds, the same process will be followed and if you don't respond or you aren't able to, the car will automatically brake itself to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Want to go further? Well, a key option of what BMW calls its driving assistant pack, which gives you a whole range of extra camera-based safety features. These include forward collision warning to tell you if you're getting too close to the car in front, a preventative pedestrian protection feature that warns you if someone's just about to step off the pavement in front of you, a high beam assistance system that'll automatically dip your headlights for you at night and a speed limit information setup that pictures the speed signs as you pass them and then displays them for you on the dash. A further driving assistant plus pack gives you two additional features. First, a congestion assistant that steers and moves the car automatically at low speeds in traffic. And second, a cruise control with stop and go function that on the highway can automatically slow the car to a stop should you come across a tailback and then, when appropriate, return it to a cruising speed. Where this Series 2 Grand Tourer model's mini routes really ought to pay off is when it comes to the issue of efficient running costs. Uh, the lightweight design should help here. The bonnet, for example, is made of aluminium and weighs just 8 kilograms. That's about 50% less than a conventionally produced component. As usual with BMW, though, most of the efficiency gains are down to the brand's clever, efficient dynamics technology. The elements of this are copied by just about every other manufacturer in this segment, but the way that the Munich maker has put them all together really seems to have hit the efficiency sweet spot. Uh, we're talking here of things like uh, on-demand use of ancillary units, electric power steering, low rolling resistance tyres, uh, brake energy regeneration and an auto start-stop system to cut the engine when you don't need it uh, when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. 
The Steptronic six-speed auto transmission you get with the three-cylinder models also includes a coasting function that uh, disconnects the engine at a cruise until you need it. Then there's uh, aerodynamics, which inevitably play a key role when it comes to matters of efficiency. To that end, there's a sleek shape with smooth-surfaced underbody panelling that creates a class-leadingly slippery 0.28 CD drag factor. This is also aided by neat design touches like the integral aero curtain, which uses two vertical air inlets in the front bumper to direct the airstream along the front wheels. Plus, there are clever air flaps behind the BMW kidney grille and in the lower cooling air intake that optimise the aerodynamic airflow into the engine. Of course, the driver must also play his or her part. So there's an optimum gear shift indicator on the dash and an Eco Pro mode that you can select in the drive performance control system that'll focus all of the car systems on ultimate frugality. The extra economy created in that Eco Pro setting, uh, BMW reckon it could be up to 20%, is fed back to the driver with in-car displays showing the additional number of miles achieved. Finally, there's also an Eco Pro route option in the navigation system that'll plot your journey in the most efficient manner. And the results of all that effort? Well, inevitably, the returns you get from this Grand Tourer won't be quite as good as those you could have achieved from an identically engined five-seat active Tourer 2 Series model. But this seven-seat design's extra 100 kilograms or so of weight doesn't weigh too heavily on the figures. Expect it to cost around 10% more to run than its stablemate, which means that the most frugal 1.5-litre three-cylinder diesel 216D variant can manage up to 68.9 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 108 grams per kilometre of CO2. To give you some perspective as to how that stacks up against base diesel versions of rivals, uh, this is a showing that gets this car to within a fraction of the class-leading Citroen Grand C4 Picasso, matches a Renault Grand Scenic, and is about 10% better than you'd achieve with the most frugal Volkswagen Touran or Ford Grand C-Max. Not a bad effort then, given that this is BMW's first stab in this market. To be frank though, if we were buying this car, we'd be doing so with a view to regularly using the seven seat capacity. And if we were gonna do that, then we want more than a three cylinder mini drive 116 brake horsepower, 1.5 litre engine to do it with. The obvious solution for this is for Grand Tour buyers to trade up to the four cylinder to an 8D model, which gets you a two litre, 150 brake horsepower diesel with around 25% more pulling power. That'll make all the difference on a steep hill with a car full of kids and the efficiency penalty involved won't be too onerous. Combined cycle consumption for the 218D is 64.2 miles per gallon uh, with CO2 emissions of 115 grams per kilometre. Nor is there any efficiency penalty for choosing an automatic version in the way that there would be with obvious rivals. I mean it's all very impressive. If you're a lower mileage buyer and looking at petrol power, the first Grand Tourer variant your dealer will probably direct you to is the 218i, which like the 216D uses a one and a half litre three cylinder power plant. This one also borrowed from the Mini and putting out 136 brake horsepower. It's capable of 53.3 miles per gallon and 123 grams per kilometre of CO2. Further up the petrol range, the 192 brake horsepower 220i manages 44.8 miles per gallon and 145 grams per kilometre. We think though that the engine of choice for most potential 2 Series Grand Tourer buyers will be the one we're trying here, the 190 brake horsepower 2 litre unit used in the top 220D variant, the only model in the range offered with a choice of either front wheel drive or four wheel drive. This engine only comes made to eight speed automatic transmission, but since this gearbox gives you better returns than a stick shift transmission would, that's no drawback. Go for a front wheel drive 220D derivative and you can expect up to 62.8 miles per gallon and 119 grams per kilometre, while the four wheel drive X-Drive version I'm trying here manages 57.6 miles per gallon and 129 grams per kilometre. You could live with that in exchange for the extra winter traction. What else? Well, as usual with BMW, there's a condition-based service indicator on the dash to advise you when your car needs a garage visit. But new to me was the clever teleservices feature that comes as part of the BMW connected drive services that you can access through the iDrive infotainment system. 
via this before each service appointment is due, your 2 Series can put in a teleservices call to your nominated BMW service centre, complete with detailed information on vehicle condition. Uh, you'll then get a call to arrange a service appointment, something you'll already have budgeted for if, at the point of original purchase, you opted for one of the two fixed-cost Service Inclusive or Service Inclusive Plus packages, which cover you for five years or 50,000 miles. On to the warranty. Uh, BMW offers a warranty that lasts for three years, no matter how many miles you complete. As for insurance groups, well, you're looking at Group 10E or 11E for the 216D, Group 14E or 15E for the 218D, and Group 19E or 20E for this top 220D xDrive variant. Those in search of petrol power will be looking at Group uh, 13E or 14E for the 218i and Group 20E for the 220i. Here's what the so-called experts in the motoring press have said about this car. That it'll be pricier than a mainstream brand compact people carrier. And that the same kind of money would buy you a much larger MPV from the next class up. Or a seven-seat family SUV. Here, though, we're going to assume two things. First, that you probably could have worked all that out for yourself. And second, that the whole reason you'd be looking at this car in the first place is because you'd like something a bit nicer than a mainstream brand. And you don't want a hulking great MPV or SUV. If that's the case, then we can see how this BMW might appeal. In often things like people carrying practicality, three-cylinder engines and front-wheel drive, this Bavarian brand is evolving. As it does so, the company is at the same time driving change here in this seven-seat compact MPV segment, reminding buyers in this class that style and driving dynamics aren't incompatible with family versatility. Of course, the front-driven layout gives this car a less driver-orientated feel than you'll find in other BMWs. The brand's traditional buyers may not like that, so it's just as well that this model isn't aimed at them. No, you'll be interested in what's on offer here if your need for practicality is greater than your need for a BMW. But you'd still rather like one. If that makes sense to you, then this model will too. Ultimately, this car is all about the democratisation of premium quality. Why should you be denied a prestige badge just because you've a growing family and need seven seats? With a 2 Series Grand Tourer, you don't have to be. OK, it's probably not the BMW ideally wanted back in your college years, but today it may well be the one you actually need. Certainly, if compromises have to be made to suit changes in your life, then this car represents a remarkably pleasant way of making them, creating an MPV you could want from the kind of one you might merely need. And there's something to be said for that. Life happens, but... Uh, there's no reason why you can't better enjoy the journey.